resumes. Questions without notice. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. The government has blocked amendments to allow the Fair Work Commission to hear disputes arising specifically from the Morrison government's hiring credit scheme, claiming its unfair dismissal laws are enough. Can the minister confirm that no casual workers with less than 12 months' service are covered by the government's unfair dismissal protections? The minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Let me start by saying, and I thank Senator Ciccone for the question. Let me start by saying, of course, it is expected that the job maker hiring credit will support around 450,000 jobs for young people to move them back into employment Order. at a cost of four billion dollars. We know that uh, employers will be able to claim the job maker hiring credit for new jobs created over the 12-month period beginning on the 7th of October for up to 12 months for each job. The uh, credit itself is only available for additional jobs. Uh, employers can't reduce their current workforce either by dismissing employees or reducing their hours and to re-engage new workers performing the same work to receive the hiring credit. All employees have protections under existing industrial relations laws from unfair or unlawful dismissal, including non-genuine redundancies. Uh, the rules exposure draft explanatory material makes clear, and I quote, that the types of arrangements that would be prevented by the integrity provisions in the Act are varied, but would include arrangements where an employer artificially inflates their employee headcount on their payroll for a job maker period. For example, by terminating or reducing the hours of Senator an Watt, existing older on a employee. Point of order. Uh, on relevance, Mr. President, the question was actually very, very narrow. It was about whether casuals with less than 12 months service are covered by the government's unfair dismissal provisions, and the minister hasn't addressed that. Well, that the point the, is that they're excluded or, or, from Senator protection. Watt, please, I've allowed you to restate the second part. There was a preface there, and while the minister is talking about rules around that, I believe she is being directly relevant. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And uh, To reiterate, I did say that all employees have protections under in existing industrial relations laws from unfair or unlawful dismissal, including non-genuine redundancies. I was saying before, Mr President, uh, before uh, Senator Watt took a point of order, that the rules expo exposure draft explanatory material makes clear that the types of arrangements that would be prevented by the integrity provisions in the Act are varied but would include arrangements where an employer artificially inflates their employee headcount order. and or Senator payroll, Payne, payroll I have for Senator Wong job. on a point of order. Senator Wong. Uh, the question goes to the government's unfair dismissal protections, and the minister was asked to confirm that no casual employee with less than 12 months service was covered. Uh, and I would, on the basis of direct relevance, ask her to return to that point. Senator. Wong, that was the question at the end of a preamble. I think the minister, by talking about the, those relevant provisions of that of the particular act, is being directly relevant. Um, there's an opportunity to debate the merit of answers after question time. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. And I note, in relation to unfair dismissal, that as I understand it, uh, an eligible employee can make an unfair dismissal claim if they have been dismissed and consider Order. their dismissal unfair. It's unlikely to be a valid reason for dismissal if an employer dismisses an, as an employee Order. Payne, to engage a new individual to take— Senator Payne, do it. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Did the government explain to Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts that under the Morrison government's existing laws, casual employees with less than 12 months continuous service have no protection under unfair dismissal in the Fair Work Act? Did the government also explain that any worker, whether they are casual, part-time or full-time, employed by a small business who has worked for less than 12 months service also has no protection from unfair dismissal claims? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And I am absolutely confident that senators who come to this Senator, chamber to make decisions in voting on legislation make decisions based on their own views, their own perspectives, and the information that they have at hand, the information that is available through the committee process, through the parliamentary process, through the engagement with government process. And if those opposite wish to impugn the integrity of Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts, that is a matter for them, but that is not something the government is going to do. Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary question. Did the government also explain to Senator Hanson and Roberts that they have now exposed more than a million workers to being sacked without recourse in the middle of the deepest recession 
in Australia in a century? Why is the government refusing to protect workers by making sure those with a job get to keep that job? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And, uh, I would reiterate what I said uh, in relation to Senator Ciccone's first supplementary question, and that is the manner in which senators come to this chamber make the decisions they make about uh, how they vote, what they support and what they don't support. Uh, they engage in the full uh, repertoire of information that is available to them. They engage with government. I'm sure they engage with uh, those opposite uh, as well, although one would be not sure how productive that would be. But nevertheless, those processes are undertaken and senators make their own decisions. I don't impugn the integrity of senators. I don't impugn the integrity of senators who make their, their decisions based on the information before Order. them. I'm not going to impugn Senator Hanson. I'm not going to impugn Senator Roberts. If those opposite and Senator Tony wish to do so, that is a matter for them. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you. Order on my left. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Burning Birmingham. Can the minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government's strong economic leadership is meeting the challenge of COVID-19, getting the economy back on track and Australians back into jobs? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President, and, uh, and I thank Senator Smith for, uh, for his question and his very important question, because indeed Australia is leading the world when it comes to the economic recovery from the COVID-induced recession that the globe is facing. COVID-19 pandemics had a profound impact on Australia, as it has had on countries right across the world. Our economy, as we know, contracted by 7 per cent in the June quarter. But this was substantially less, a much better performance than many of our international peers. In the UK, it contracted by more than 20 per cent in Canada by more than 11 per cent, in the United States by more than 9 per cent. It was the decisive action that our government was able to take, thanks to years of good economic management, that enabled us to respond so strongly. And we're now seeing our economy recover well as well. Our economic recovery plan is working. It's a long journey to come back from a hit this big, but 450,000 jobs have been recreated in the last four months. More than half of the record number of jobs lost from the COVID-19 crisis have already been recovered. Yesterday, we saw the Consumer Sentiment Index has risen again for the third straight month. In fact, Consumer Sentiment last month had its single biggest rise in a budget month since the series was created in 1974. We also saw the Consumer Confidence Index up for the 10th consecutive week, and it's now hit an eight-month high. Business confidence is up as well, Mr President. It's up for trade, it's up for transport, up in construction and up in mining. We're seeing there, Mr President, the Australian economy recover because of the type of policy measures our government put in place to get business through the pandemic and to help them out of the pandemic. JobKeeper has seen $70 billion of support flow, but our other measures in this budget Order, are Senator now Birmingham. about helping Time that growth the agenda. Has expired. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how the Morrison government's job maker hiring credit will support Australia's economic recovery? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, the job maker hiring credit is an important part of our budget. Our budget outlined incentives to be able to help businesses be encouraged to invest more, to ensure that they could carry back losses, to be able to recognise those under financial pressure this year, to ensure they can invest and deduct, to incentivise the bringing forward of economic activity. And yes, the hiring credit helps them to in and encourages them to employ more young Australians. We have done the research about what the impact has been in previous recessions, and we know that youth unemployment took the longest to recover from previous recessions. We know when we look at the old New Start data as well that where young Australians get stuck on unemployment for too long, it is so much harder to get them off of those unemployment benefits. That's why the JobMaker hiring credit was, is being put in place to provide that incentive to make sure we don't have undue numbers of young Australians stuck on the unemployment queues any longer than is necessary. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister explain how the Morrison government is playing a leadership role on the global economic recovery from the pandemic? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, although it is a long and hard road back from a hit the size of this, 
and we are working to share our experiences with the rest of the world. The Prime Minister and other ministers have been actively engaged throughout this time in seeking knowledge and lessons from other parts of the world, but also in sharing our experience in successfully suppressing the spread of COVID-19, our experience in securing employment and jobs and businesses wherever we can through the type of responses we've put in place. The Prime Minister is preparing to participate in the Australia ASEAN Summit, the East Asia Summit and the APEC Leaders Summit, as well as the G20 Summit over the course of the next weekend. We're playing a leading role in WTO negotiations as well in areas of fishery subsidies to ensure the sustainable future of our oceans, as well as on e-commerce, where we negotiate the first set of global rules on digital trade, so important, ever more important, as we've seen the way economies and businesses pivoted during this pandemic. It's our leadership that has helped get Australia through, and Order. we are working Senator constructively Birmingham. with the world Senator too. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. A former Liberal staffer who worked for the Minister in a senior capacity asserts in a complaint made to the Department of Finance that she faced bullying and gaslighting in the Minister's office due to her relationship with Minister Tudge. She said, and I quote, during this time the Minister was also posting text messages on the office WhatsApp group that I felt were attacking and demeaning towards myself. Is this true? The Minister for um, Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, well, in response to your question, no, it is not. Uh, a more fulsome answer is this. I completely reject the allegations that this employee, Ms Rochelle Miller, has made against me and my former Chief of Staff that were reported in two media outlets today. During the time of her employment, between late 2017 and mid-2018, Ms Miller was provided with support, leave and flexible work arrangements to accommodate her own personal circumstances. In fact, in the ABC article today, Ms Miller herself is quoted as saying, due to the persistent rumours across the building during my first week in the office, I confidentially let Minister Cash know that I was in a relationship with Alan that was now over and that my loyalty was to her. She was supportive and kind. But, Mr President, I am also particularly disappointed with the potentially defamatory allegations published by the ABC, which are false, and made against my former Chief of Staff who, now being a private citizen, was not even given a chance by the ABC to respond to the story before it was published. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. When did the minister first become aware of the official complaint and the conduct to which it relates? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, it won't be of surprise to many. I was made aware of the complaint when a journalist contacted my office yesterday. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. The complainant has said that she was bullied by the minister's chief of staff. Is this the same chief of staff that was under investigation by the AFP uh, for illegally leaking to the media and confirmed to be the source of the illegal leak, or was it another one? Senator Cash. Uh, this was not that same Chief of Staff, and I will again confirm on behalf of the Chief of Staff, against which the allegations have been made, I am particularly disappointed with the potentially defamatory allegations published by the ABC, which are false and made against my former Chief of Staff, who, as I said, despite now being a private citizen was not even given a chance to respond to the story before it was published. Order. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Foreign Minister, Minister Payne. We know from US President-elect Biden's report of this morning's phone call between the President-elect and the Prime Minister that the discussion included confronting climate change. And interestingly, that the report of the equivalent conversation with the Japanese Prime Minister noted their shared commitment to tackle climate change. 
We also know that the Prime Minister tried to cut the climate crisis out of reports of his conversation with UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, so I'd like to get some things on the table now. How did climate feature in the conversation the Prime Minister had with President-elect Biden, and did they discuss how Australia's 2030 targets lag the rest of the world, contrasting starkly with President-elect Biden's commitment to zero carbon electricity by 2035? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Rice uh, for her question. I've seen uh, the readout of uh, the President-elect's uh, call with, uh, with Prime Minister Morrison. Uh, I think it is important to reinforce, uh, and I notice, of course, Senator Rice did not refer to this, but uh, both uh, leaders, uh, President-elect Biden and the Prime Minister, made clear our strong commitment to strengthening our alliance even further as we head towards the 70th anniversary of ANZUS next year. We agreed that there was no more critical time for our alliance as we face the global pandemic and we face a much more uncertain strategic environment. Point Pro of order. Senator Rice on a point of order. Point of order, Mr President. I'd ask you to draw the minister's attention to the topic of my question, which was specifically about how climate change was addressed in the conversation with President-elect Biden. Uh, on, on the point of order, um, it referenced the phone call as well, so I think for part of the answer, the minister is entitled to address the phone call as well. Um, following you, you have requested me, I'm sure the minister is aware of the second part of the question. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. As I was saying, and I think I had just said uh, they, the leaders discussed their shared values and many shared interests, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. They also discussed the need for like-minded liberal democracies to do more together, which I'm sure would be endorsed by Senator Rice and uh, those uh, in her party, whether it is in the G7+, Plus, the Quad, the G20, through the leadership of multilateral institutions. Uh, the Prime Minister Morrison has also indicated that uh, their discussion included addressing global environmental challenges, including reducing greenhouse gas emissions and plastics pollution in the oceans. The Prime Minister welcomed President-elect Biden's commitment that the United States would rejoin the Paris Agreement, which, uh, as I would note, pr um, Mr President, Australia has been a continuing and committed member of the agreement. They also discussed the alignment between the uh, president-elect's uh, climate change platform and Australia's focus on practical measures to reduce emissions through investment uh, in clean technology and to explore opportunities for partnerships on clean technology investment and deployment. Senator Rice, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Vice President-elect Joe Biden has described the climate crisis as the number one issue facing humanity. Will Australia be represented at the climate summit President-elect Biden has pledged to hold within the first 100 days of his presidency? And I'll also invite the minister to actually respond to the point in my first question as whether they discussed 2030 targets in their phone call. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I've indicated what matters were discussed in the phone call, and I indicated across five points, I think, Mr President, what they were. Uh, it is a matter for President-elect Biden and the administration, once it is formed, uh, as to how they convene uh, that meeting. There are a number of other meetings. President-elect Biden, indica President Biden has indicated he wishes to, uh, to convene, uh, and Australia would welcome an opportunity to participate. Senator Rice, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. At the COP26 conference in Glasgow next year, the US is certain to submit a more ambitious target than us for 2030, having already committed to the same target as us, 26 to 28 per cent below 2005 levels, five years earlier than us by 2025. And furthermore, European countries have already committed to increasing their ambition to 55 per cent between 1990 pollution levels by 2030. Will the government commit to stronger, more ambitious 2030 targets ahead of COP26? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Rice for her uh, supplementary question. The Australian government intends to communicate our long-term emissions reduction strategy before COP26. The Paris Agreement encourages parties to strive to formulate and communicate long-term low greenhouse gas emission development strategies. It does not, uh, as it stands, require us to submit a long-term emissions reduction target. 
This government has released the Technology Investment Roadmap's first annual low emissions technology statement, setting out stretch goals for key technologies to underpin the transmission to a low emissions economy. These goals will be reviewed annually and with the flexibility of adding new technologies as appropriate. Australia's Paris target to reduce emissions by 26 to 28 per cent on 2005 levels by 2030 is a responsible and ambitious con contribution to global climate action. It is ambitious because it represents a halving of emissions per person in Australia and a two-thirds reduction in emissions per unit of GDP. Those reductions, Mr President, are amongst the highest of G20 countries. Or Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia. The Minister will be aware that Northern Endeavour, a floating uh, production storage and offloading vessel, is sitting off the coast of Darwin in lighthouse mode after the government forced the operator into liquidation. Nopsema's refusal to direct the company as to what safety issues needed to be addressed uh, to get the vessel back into production, a criticism levelled at the government in the Walker Review, is now costing the taxpayer $1 million per, per week. That's, uh, that's 34 ICU beds per week. According to evidence provided estimates, the government has spent more than $60 million thus far. By my estimation, the government is going to shortly run out of the offensive $76 million budgeted to deal with this. Have you got enough money in the budget to deal with this blunder? How much is, is the total cost to the taxpayer going to be? And what is the plan to deal with the government's, this government-induced money slick leaking from the vessel? Order. So, the Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patrick for your question, uh, and also acknowledge some advance notice about the, the subject and the topic that you are wishing to ask me on. Can I firstly say that it is the absolute priority of this government, firstly, to ensure the safety of any crew on any of these types of vessels, but also the protection of the marine environment. Mm -hmm. And so, when putting in place um, uh, breaches in relation to safety. This government does not shy away from making sure that the absolute priority remains those two priorities that, that I laid out. Uh, but the government also um, has been very clear and very transparent about the process that it has put around, making sure that we put the protections in place uh, to make sure that, that we have safety of individuals and the protection of the environment. Um, as you would know, um, Senator Patrick, um, the Commonwealth has contracted UPS. Um, to ensure the safer operations on board the Northern Endeavour and to undertake the critical works while planning on a permanent solution for this particular issue, uh, the facility and the field in which it is currently operating. Um, we have also ensured that the necessary insurances are in place the oil and the oil spill uh, memberships are in place. And this includes memberships with the Australian Mar uh, Marine Oil Spill Centre, Oil Spill Response Limited and Lord's Ship Emergency Response Service. So, um, as part of developing a longer-term solution, we have been engaged with industry more broadly, understanding uh, that this is a matter that needs to be undertaken, um, engaging everybody, but also to make sure um, that the commercial viability of restarting such a, a program, as well as the requirements of the complete decommissioning uh, or remediation project that are associated with working, uh, making sure this project uh, or this particular facility is, is safe to people and to the environment. Um, I can assure you that the government will apply whatever resources are necessary to ensure the safety of the crew and to protect the marine environment. Mm -hmm. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Minister, what, what happened to Northern Endeavour could well happen to some of ExxonMobil's assets in the Bass Strait, which it is trying to offload. ExxonMobil has earned $42 billion in revenue over the past five tax transparency years and not paid a brass razu in tax and would appear to be seeking to devolve themselves of responsibilities for the assets that were used to generate this tax-free revenue. The cost of the taxpayer could be billions. What is the government doing to prevent this from happening? Senator Rustin. Well, um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Senator Patrick. The government takes very seriously its responsibilities about the absolute responsible um, stewardship of, uh, of the Australian taxpayer resources and also operating in a manner that is in the best interests of Australia. 
But in doing so, we also make sure that the security and safety of Australians and our marine environment or our terrestrial environment is absolutely of the utmost importance to us as, all, as well. But, um, Senator Patrick, in relation to the specifics um, around um, particular, um, particular issues that um, I wasn't aware that you were asking about, I'm more than happy to take on notice. But in an overarching way, I would absolutely commit to you that all of the behaviour of the, the government, of which I am a member, in relation to protecting the interests of Australians when it comes to the sovereignty of our country, the protecting of the resources that belong to all Australians, uh, that is something that we take extraordinarily seriously and will continue to make sure, through the appropriate independent regulation and oversight, that they are well looked after. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In October last year at Estimates, I foreshadowed this bungle. I asked Nopsema. What happens if they go into liquidation so the ha asset has to be sold off or the company is not able to operate? The taxpayer now bears the cost. That's ultimately what's, uh, what is going on. To which the response from Mr Smith of Nopsema was, we won't be taking over anything. That's not our role. And yet here we are, uh, the owners of an FPSO and a $300 million bungle. Who got fired, Minister? Who is being held accountable for this? Senator Rustin. Uh, well, there are a number of things I'd say in response to that question. Um, thank you, Mr. President, and from Senator Patrick. First of all, nothing in, in the operation in the commercial world is without risk. But of course, the government does whatever it can to mitigate to, against that risk and to minimise that risk. And that is why the role of NOPSEMA um, is so important because of their independence around um, safety of the and the environment uh, and uh, the oversight that they uh, that they undertake. Um, it's certainly the role, the role that you just suggested that NOPSEMA should have been undertaking is not their role. They are the safety uh, and environmental um, oversight body. But certainly, um, it is, as I said, it's absolutely essential when we're dealing um, you know, with any, any um, commercial activities that are re redeeming the assets of the Australian public, um, such as in the oil and gas area, that we understand their risks and we operate to mitigate against those risks. Um, but I certainly can absolutely guarantee this chamber that the safety of the Australian public, Order. workers Senator on Rustin, vessels and our environment the has is paramount. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Foreign Minister, Senator Payne. Can the Minister update the Senate on recent developments in Hong Kong? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patterson for his question. Mr. President, Beijing has this week disqualified four duly elected Legislative Council lawmakers. On the 11th of November, the 23rd meeting of the Standing Committee of the 13th National People's Congress in Beijing agreed to a resolution that outlines disqualification criteria for members of the Legislative Council, including an unspecific reference to endangering national security. It is the view of the Australian government that the disqualification of candidates to members severely undermines Hong Kong's democratic processes and institutions as well as the high degree of autonomy set out in the Basic Law and the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Australia has issued a statement. Australia calls on authorities to allow the Legislative Council to fulfil its role as the primary forum for popular political expression in Hong Kong, to remain a key pillar of the rule of law and the one country, two systems framework. We urge the Chinese government and Hong Kong authorities to uphold their long-standing commitments and international legal obligations. This is critical to maintaining international confidence in Hong Kong. This latest measure follows earlier developments that have also concerned Australia and many other nations. It continues an approach that steadily erodes the rights of the people of Hong Kong. Australia and the international community will maintain a consistent focus on human rights and principles of freedom of transparency, of autonomy and the rule of law, and will continue to monitor developments in this matter closely. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Minister. Can the Minister advise the Senate how Australia is working with our international partners on these issues? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Australia and partners, multiple partners, have made a number of joint statements on concerning developments in Hong Kong including previously with Canada, with New Zealand, with the United Kingdom and the United States. We have also done so with partners in the UN Human Rights Council and the UN General Assembly. 
These have included the imposition of the national security law, the disqualification of legislative council candidates and postponement of elections, uh, and the violence during pro-democracy protests last year and early this year, including by Hong Kong authorities. The importance of continuing to monitor, to speak in defence of, rights and freedoms of people in Hong Kong is an ongoing focus for the Australian government. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can the minister explain the importance of continuing autonomy and a higher degree of freedoms in Hong Kong? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. The international community has a very long-standing interest in Hong Kong's prosperity and stability. Australia itself has a substantial stake in Hong Kong's success. The city is home to our largest commercial presence in Asia and our biggest uh, expatriate community globally. Beijing committed to autonomy and freedoms to the Hong Kong people under the one country, two systems principle set out in the Sino-British Joint Declaration. This is a legally binding United Nations registered treaty. It also provides that rights and freedoms, including those of the person, of the press, of assembly, of association and others, will be guaranteed by law in Hong Kong. As I said in response to Senator Patterson's per first question, Australia and the international community will maintain a consistent focus on human rights and principles of freedom, autonomy, transparency Order. and Senator the rule Payne. of law. Senator Wong. I seek leave to make a very short statement. Leave granted? Uh, I, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I, I simply wish to take this opportunity to associate the opposition with the statements made by the Foreign Minister in that answer and to express our continued bipartisan support for the principles and the concerns raised in relation to Hong Kong. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister. In Senate estimates this week, it was revealed that the ABC Managing Director received half a dozen emails as well as phone calls from staff of government ministers questioning the airing of the Four Corners program inside the Canberra bubble. It was also revealed that other ABC staff and the ABC board were contacted by government representatives about the program. Who contacted the ABC board and management? When did the Prime Minister or his office first become aware that ministerial staff had contacted ABC board and management about the Four Corners program? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I'm afraid I'm not aware of those details. Senator Watt, supplementary question. Perhaps in this question the Minister could take those answers on notice. Uh, Senators Stoker Order. and Henderson asked a series of questions at Senate Estimates designed to undermine the legitimacy of the Four Corners report and the ABC. Can the minister Order. guarantee that no member of the Prime Minister's office or any other minister's offices On directed right. or assisted Senators Stoker and Henderson? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Mr President, that is quite a remarkable allegation that, uh, that Senator Watt comes in here, seeking to cast judgment Order. on questions being asked by senators. Seeking to cast judgment or impugn the motives of questions being asked at Senate estimates by other senators. And of all the people, I mean of all the people to seek to judge when it comes to Senate estimates behaviour, we're not going to take any lectures from Senator Watt. We're not going to be taking lectures about Order. standards of conduct in Senate estimates from Senator Order. Watt. Senator, on my right, I'll call Senator Watt when I can hear him. Order, Senator Senator Watt. On relevance, the question was simply whether other ministers assisted Senator Stoker or Henderson and or whether Senator, they were freelancing. Senator Watt, you know the question had a lot more than that in it. And I might say um, I will ask people to carefully re re reflect on the wording of questions when imp imp imputing motives to other senators asking questions as opposed to attributing it to a potential effect of asking questions. I didn't call you, I didn't call you up on that, but I think that came perilously close to imputing a motive to the actions of another senator in performing their duties as a senator. Now there was a lot in that question and the minister is more than directly relevant in responding. Senator Birmingham. Thanks Mr President. Now I would be very surprised if Senator Watt 
who asks a lot of Senate estimates questions, and, and good on him for doing so, but I'd be very surprised if he's never had a conversation with his leader or his leader's office or other shadow ministers or other colleagues or people outside of this building. Senators come and ask questions Order. in Senate estimates Senator all Birmingham, of the time. Senator time for the answer has expired. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The ABC managing director took on notice a question to table the emails that were sent to the ABC by government representatives in relation to the Four Corners program. Can the minister guarantee there has been no intimidation of ABC staff or threats to the ABC or its funding by the government in relation to this program? Senator Birmingham. Mr. 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 President. Mr. President. Order. The ABC's charter rights are all set in law. Its budget is laid out firmly in the budget according to the triennial funding obligations. Um, the minister has concluded his answer. Senator Wong. No guarantee of no intimidation. Order. Senator Wong. No I can't. I, of no intimidation. I, I, Senator, Senator Wong. I, yes, I can't. it's a point of order. Um, there, there, there can't be a point of order. Senator Wong, please. Senator Wong. Senator, Senator Wong, please. Order. Sen Senators Watt and Wong and Rennick. Senator Chandler is on her feet. She is going to have the call. Senator Wong, please. I've asked you several times, and I've I asked Senator Rennick too, but I was calling you before he started interjecting. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Morrison government's leadership in response to COVID-19 is supporting Australians who have been hardest hit by the economic consequences of the pandemic? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And can I thank Senator Chandler for her question? Um, the Morrison government is absolutely focused on supporting all Australians as we fight our way through this uh, incredible pandemic as we open the economy. Over the course of this year, the government has provided leadership and support to the community. We have tried to cushion the blow from the pandemic with enormous fiscal and economic support through programs such as the JobKeeper program, the Job Maker program in the budget and enhanced measures across the income support system. This week, the Prime Minister and I announced that we will extend temporarily the enhanced support through the social security system for a further three months as economic confidence builds and momentum builds across the economy. We are spending $3.2 billion in the first three months of next year uh, to extend the supplement from 1 January to 31 March. But importantly, our extended temporary measures go much, much further than just the supplement. For an additional three months, we will be expanding uh, the eligibility for these payments. These measures will enable about 185,000 people to access payment during these uncertain and challenging times who otherwise would not be eligible for payment. And that includes such things as the extension of the partner income taper test so that people will be able to access uh, some uh, payments where their partner earns less than $80,000 a year. We'll also be extending eligibility to people like sole traders, people who are self-employed, people who have been stood down, people who are having to isolate and people who are looking after somebody who has had to isolate as a result of the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, we will also extend the nil rate period, which basically means people will be able to retain um, their concession cards as they return to the workforce to provide additional confidence and security and certainty to them as they make that very, very important transition back to work. Through these extensions, the new measures like the one-off payment to pensioners, we will stand side by side with all Australians as Order. we recover Senator from the Rustin. pandemic. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is the government managing Australia's comprehensive and well-targeted social security system to encourage people back into the workforce? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, as we extend additional and temporary supports, we also need to make sure that we strike the right balance between providing elevated levels of support to people but also providing incentives for people to re-engage with the workforce. And that's why in September we have temporarily increased the income-free area of the job seeker payment and youth allowance other payment uh, to allow people to earn up to $300 per fortnight. That means that recipients can earn that $300 a fortnight without losing a cent of their payment. 
So we're extending this measure for another three months from the 1st of January because we want to make sure that people have the confidence to go back and test themselves, just put their toe in the water in the job market, even if it is only for a day a week. And we know through our priority, priority investment approach that people who report earnings, even if they're only a small amount of earnings, are twice as likely to come off payment uh, than those people who do not report earnings. This is absolutely essential as we help people to re-engage with the workforce as our economy opens and people can go back Senator to work. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate how the government's economic recovery plan is generating positive signs for our economic recovery? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, it is really pleasing to be able to tell the Senate that the economic outlook is improving. I mean, just last week, the, uh, the Reserve Bank confirmed that the economic recovery in Australia is well underway, and they upgraded their forecasts around the Australian economic growth and for our labour market. I mean, pleasingly, 450,000 jobs have been created in the last four months, uh, with more than half of the record number of jobs lost having already now been recovered. And the RBA expects that further in, in uh, uh, easing in the domestic um, activity around restrictions, particularly in Victoria, uh, is going to see um, a boost to employment over the coming months. Um, the ANZ Australian job advertisements rose 9.4 per cent in October, uh, following an 8.3 per cent increase in September. And we've now regained more than three quarters of the fall uh, that we saw between March and April. The ABS data is also showing significant uh, growth and improvement in job vacancies being reported. Consumer confidence is up. Order, and Senator Rustin. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. The Job Seeker Coronavirus Supplement payment was $550 per fortnight, which the government then reduced in September to $250 a fortnight. Can the minister confirm this represents a $300 reduction per fortnight? Senator, the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Polly for her question and her persistence in this particular issue. Senator Polly, I have to say that no matter how you look at an increase in the budget, an increase in the, the amount of spending that is being put Order. into a particular— Senator, Senator, I, I'm going to take Senator Polly's point of order when I can hear her. Um, if your colleagues would stop interjecting, I'll take your point of order. Senator Polly. My point of order is it was a very direct question to the minister. Has there been and yeah. does it mean that there's been a $300 um, a fortnight I, I, reduction? I appreciate the. Um, can I make a ruling before you take it? Okay. Um, I appreciate the um, point you are trying to make. In my view, I cannot put words into a minister's mouth nor instruct them on the terms on how to answer a question. If the minister is talking about the very supplement and the very amount and challenging an assumption in the question, I view that as directly relevant. It is very narrow, and so the answer must deal with this particular payment supplement, in my view, to be directly relevant. Senator Wong. Uh, well, on the point of order, uh, Mr President, uh, and may I, may I ask you to reconsider the ruling you just made? because. In my submission, uh, that really does undermine the basis of that standing order and previous rulings. There is a very direct question which goes to whether or not 550 less 250 represents $300 reduction per fortnight. Uh, and just because, just because there's a reference uh, in the minister's answer to the payment, uh, the name of the payment does not make it directly relevant to the question. Uh, my submission goes to actually ensuring that this question time operates as a forum for ministerial accountability rather than as an opportunity for people to pretend black is white. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, on the point of order, Mr President, it is essential for a minister to be able to contest or question the validity, the elements or otherwise of a question in their response to that question. A question cannot simply be presented in a manner that expects a black or white response. That is why we have a period of time for ministers to respond in question time. Uh, Mr President, your approach has been a consistent one 
that yes, the narrower the question, the narrower the scope for the response. But certainly, where a question relates to a particular payment, where a question relates to a particular payment, then there has to be an opportunity for a minister to reflect on all of the elements of that payment, not just not just respond to the narrow proposition that the opposition may want. So, I will restate what I have said before on this matter. In my view, to be directly relevant means that an answer must directly refer to or address, including challenging material or assertions contained in a question. There was no preamble for this question. I accept that. I did not say, and I reject any assertion that I said a minister only had to mention the payment. As long as the minister is talking about the payment and only the payment and the supplement that was asked about in that question and not ranging across other matters. Not a the point, Senator Wong, is that this minister has to directly address the topic raised. It is not appropriate, it is not appropriate for the chair to try and insert words into Senator Wong, if I could be honest, Senator Wong, I will continue to make my ruling and I will take as many submissions as, as, as um, senators want, but I haven't finished making my point yet. I did not say that the minister only had to mention the name of the payment. I said previously the minister had to be talking directly about the payment. Now, that was a very specific question. I made the point there is no preamble. I have allowed you to remind the minister of the question, and I have made it clear that I am going to strictly apply the test of direct relevance so that the minister must talk about that payment or supplement, as the case may be, in your question. But I cannot instruct her as to a manner or fashion of answering it. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and look, for, for the, as much as you might like to come in here and try and make me say something for some sort of social media grab that you want me to do, Senator Polly, I'm not going to do that. But what I will do is I'm more than happy to stand in here for hours and hours and hours and talk to the chamber about the, math, the provisions that we have put in place as a government—507 billion dollars of them—to support the Australian people and the Australian economy. But Senator Wong, on the point of order. Direct relevance. I ask that you might remind this minister of the question. Um, on that point, Senator Rustin, um, the question was specific in nature. It does not provide an opportunity to range across other activities of the government in dealing with this particular crisis. I made my point earlier. Your answer to be directly relevant to a specific question must be about this particular payment. That is my test on direct relevance, um, and not other activities or a more wide-ranging. Um, uh, answer about policy. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And, and equally, I'm more than happy to be talking about the coronavirus supplement, which is the matter on which Senator Polly's question um, was prim primarily based on. Um, but what I would like to specifically say, to, oh, well, the only thing that the Senator Polly's question was based on, uh, and what I would like to say, um, Mr President, is that the government put in place the coronavirus supplement, which is a supplement on top of the job seeker payment, to support Australians through this crisis. In September, after the extension, the, the, the coronavirus supplement expired, as per the legislation that was voted on by everybody in this chamber, you all voted for it to, to, to go to the 25th of September. Order. On the 20th of September, it expired. On the 25th of September, we put in an extension. And equally, this week we have announced that as of the 1st of January 2021, we will be continuing to extend that payment in conjunction with the job seeker payment for another three months. But as I explained to you yesterday, it is part of a suite of measures that we have put in place to help Australians. But if you'd like me to just talk about the coronavirus supplement, it is something that we put in place. We recognise the job market remains shallow, and that's why we have chosen to to extend the payment from the 1st of January, just like we extended the payment Order, on the 25th Senator of Rustin. September. Senator Polly, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday, the government announced that the Job Seeker fortnightly supplement would go from $250 per fortnight to $150 per fortnight from the 1st of January. Can the minister confirm this? reduction represents $100 less a fortnight, and I am being persistent. Senator Rustin. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. And Senator Polly, yes, you are being persistent. Um, but Senator Polly, um, it, at the risk of actually repeating my answer to the previous question, um, I categorically um, will put on the record for as many times as you ask this question, the government has on two occasions extended the coronavirus supplement as a part of the job seeker payment. And to come in here and suggest that an additional $3.2 billion, which the extension of the coronavirus supplement between the 1st of January and the 31st of March, will actually deliver straight into the pockets of Australians in that three-month period, $3.2 billion, you cannot possibly you cannot possibly categorize the expenditure of 3.2 billion dollars as a cut now senator polly i absolutely cannot understand how you cannot actually accept the fact 3.2 billion dollars of expenditure is actually order an senator increase. rustin senator polly a final supplementary question instead of playing word games minister why can't you be honest about the impact of your decision on struggling Australians. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and thanks, Senator Polly, for giving me some latitude to talk about the impact on Australians. We have stood side by side with Australians who have been impacted by the coronavirus, side by side, providing them with support to help them through this crisis. Not just in my portfolio area, particularly in Minister Cash's portfolio with small business, in the Treasurer's portfolio with the JobKeeper payment, across just about every portfolio area. I mean, Senator Payne, we've been supporting our neighbours in the in the region, in the Pacific. Yeah, yeah. Helping them, Senator uh, Senator Reynolds, in terms of defence, making sure that defence personnel have been helping us through the crisis. Yeah. To come in here and suggest that we have not been helping Australians, standing side by side with Australians, helping through this pandemic, I have to say, is nothing more than abject rubbish, Senator Polly. But what I would say is we will continue to stand by Australians yeah, by providing yeah. them with the help, the welfare support that they need to get through this pandemic, and we don't shy about. It, no matter how much Order, you Senator must Rustin, ask time questions. for the answer has expired. Order. 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 Senators Rustin and Wong. Order. Senator. Order. Senator Rennick. Senator Canavan. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. President. Um, <laughs> And my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development, Senator Cash. In my home state of Queensland, our agricultural industries contribute more than $12 billion to the economy. Without investment, though, in water security, we risk the future of agriculture in the regions at a time that we're already navigating the economic impacts of COVID. Can the minister advise the Senate how the Morrison McCormack government's plan? to build dams across Australia is providing leadership on water security issues for rural and regional Australians. The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator Canavan for his question and acknowledge his passion for his home state of Queensland, but also for Northern Australia. And Senator Canavan, as you would know, the Liberal National Government is getting on with the job of building new water infrastructure to meet the needs of regional Australia, but to also help, Mr President, make our regions stronger. As Senator, Can as Senator Canavan had said to me earlier, whilst we are grateful for the recent rains, uh, we need to ensure the security supply and quality of our water. That is absolutely central to the future of regional Australia, but it is also, Mr President, central to the economic growth for all Australians. Uh, Senators will be pleased to know that in the recent budget the government announced an additional $2 billion in grant funding under the National Water Infrastructure Development Fund. Mr President, this now brings the total commitment of the government to $3.5 billion to build dams, weirs and pipelines. And in fact, this additional investment, Senator Canavan, as you know, it supports the government's commitment to a rolling 10-year water infrastructure investment program. Mr President, the government has also now committed $1.5 billion through the fund to co-fund the construction of more than 20 
water infrastructure projects with a total construction value colleagues, of $2.7 billion. And Senator Canavan, you will be pleased to know that the Charleston Dam in far north Queensland, which I know you've been to far north Queensland on a regular basis, will now be finished in the coming weeks. And Mr President, unlike those on the other side, Senator Canavan does know where far north Queensland actually is. But a further 10 water projects have been contracted and are underway, and more than 50 feasibility projects have been undertaken to Order. assess their viability. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. I thank the minister for that answer. And can the minister provide some more detail and an update on the progress of the Rookwood Weir project, a project that could double agricultural basin uh, production Order. in the Fitzroy Basin? Order. Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr President, in Queensland, the Liberal National Government has an investment value of over $516 million for 28 water infrastructure products and studies. In fact, as Senator Canavan has asked, the Rockwood Weir is a $352 million project and, Mr President, it will generate 200 jobs during construction on the Fitzroy River near Rockhampton. And, Mr President, in relation to the awarding of the contract, a local contractor was awarded the contract for the build. That is a great thing for that local contractor. And I understand that jobs for this fantastic build are actually being advertised as we speak. That is what this investment is all about, supporting these local contractors and Senator Canavan, uh, creating those local jobs. And in fact, the projected water outcome, Senator Canavan, for Rookwood Weir is 50,000 megalitres of high reliability water. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, during the um, Queensland election campaign that just finished, uh, the Labor Party committed to apply to apply to the federal government for funds to build the Urana Dam. Is the minister aware of any approach by the Queensland Labor government in relation to the construction of the Urana Dam project? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, Senator Canavan, you may be aware that the Deputy Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, wrote to the state water ministers in September. And the Deputy Prime Minister asked them to bring forward their water infrastructure Order. priorities for consideration, Mr. President, by the National Order, Water Senator Green Watt. Authority. Uh, Senator Canavan, I'm disappointed. I am disappointed to have to inform you that the Queensland Government has not yet brought forward projects, including the Urana Dam project, for consideration. Senator Canavan, just in case you didn't hear me, the Queensland Government has not yet brought forward projects including the Urana Dam project for consideration. But Senator Canavan, maybe they don't appreciate like you do the value. The value of the Urana um, Dam to Queensland. And Mr President, it is a huge business case. It suggests a water storage capacity up Order. to 1.1 million megalitres and 675 operational jobs. Order. Or on my left and right. Resist the temptation, Senator Watt, to fill the silence. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. A report from analytics consultancy Taylor Fry has found the reductions to JobSeeker and JobKeeper payments in late September had an, and I quote, instant and dramatic impact on the finances of Australian households. Why is the government withdrawing fiscal support from the economy and reducing income to Australian households when so many Australians are doing it tough? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank the Senator for her question, um, uh, perhaps a repeat of the question I received from Senator Polly under a different guise. But, um, but uh, thank you very much for, for your question. And once again, um, I would reiterate that a decision taken by government, and this is, this is giving you a bit of a lecture about how budgets work, but a decision taken by government to increase the amount of funding that is available to the economy must only be considered as an increase. Now, for instance, in the budget there were $507 billion worth of measures that were included to support Australia in our, uh, as we come out of the COVID pandemic. 
Last week, well, actually, no, two days ago, the Prime Minister and I announced another $3.2 billion. There is, it would ends up that means that there is $510.2 billion, which means that's $3.2 billion more, Senator. So you cannot possibly say that it is not an increase in spending. But what I would say, Senator, is um, the really positive news and the reason why we have been in a position to be able to work with Australians to put the right balance in place between providing elevated levels of support, recognising, Senator, that the economy is still only in the early stages of recovery, the jobs market still does remain shallow, and that is why we made the decision to extend the supplement to support Australians. I mean, over the last four months, 450,000 jobs have been created. Of the 1.3 million jobs that were lost in the early stages of the pandemic, 750,000 of those have come back. We are seeing the economic recovery start. We are seeing positive moves in the jobs market, but we also understand that Australians do need continued elevated levels of support, and that's why the Prime Minister and I this week made the announcement to extend the, uh, the uh, coronavirus supplement for a further three months, along with all those other changes and enhancements that we will leave Order, in place Senator for those Rustin. three months. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. The report found the government's reductions in JobKeeper and JobSeeker will result in $4 billion less income in the pockets of 5 million Australians. Why is the government reducing households' abilities to spend and support jobs in the economy? Senator Rustin. Mm. Not quite sure how I answer this because clearly um, you don't understand the difference between an additional expenditure and when additional expenditure doesn't occur. I have told this chamber on so many occasions in the last two days that we have made an additional $3.2 billion available to Australians in the first three months of the next year. So I don't know how you can actually couch that in any other terms but additional funding. So you can't say you've cut something that was never there in the first place, Senator. There was never there in the first place. But what we have done is we have made the announcement that we are going to extend the supplement, extend the supplement, and that is $3.2 billion over three months. But you know, I, it is really important that we let Australians know that the economy is starting to recover. It is starting to open up. Jobs are being created. And in fact, the Reserve Bank said that the measures that have been put in place by this government have actually Order, been part Senator of the reason Rustin, we're recovering. Uh, Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. The government's own figures say that 1.8 million Australians will be relying on JobSeeker in December. Why does the minister think unemployment payments should be going down when people's costs have stayed the same? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, and at the risk of repeating myself for the 456th time today, I mean, I might call a point of order on myself for repetition. Um, but the fact is, Senator, that the the economy is starting to open up. We are starting to see jobs come back. Our job figures are showing that there are more jobs are being advertised, more jobs are being created, and more people are able to go back to work. In fact, we saw in uh, in the May figures that we had 1.6 million people on payment, and at the end of October we see 1.5 million people on payment. Now that is way too many people on payment. We don't shy away from that, which is why we've extended the supplement to help those people uh, through what is a tough time. But most particularly, we want to help them in their pathway back to employment, and that is why here, here. the supplement here, here. remains in place. But we do need to balance the difference between making sure that there's elevated levels of support to help those people, but at the same time we want to put the incentives in place because it's our job to help people back to work. Here, here. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on here, notice, here. and in doing so can I just acknowledge up in the gallery the presence of Senator Rustin's mum, Joy, who's travelled from Renmark to be with us. Welcome, Joy.